Hey everyone, welcome back to Real Talk Rudy. Got a really cool presentation for you today. It's a little on the longer side. Uh, I, would, I would expect it to run maybe about a half hour. Bear with me, it's really cool pertinent information on Bitcoin. That should get your ears to prick up a little bit. If that doesn't, you can always just look at my awesome shirt. That's okay too. Uh, this should be my best presentation so far. After only three videos, maybe that's not saying too much, but uh, you know, let me know what you think. Let's get started. So this presentation is was done because I keep getting asked by by friends, you know, what do you think of cryptocurrency? What do you think of Bitcoin? Do you invest in it? Where do you think it's going? And that's based off of the hype that it's gotten in the media, on the internet, etc. And honestly. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool story. I'm not going to tell you exactly what I invest in or what you should invest in, but I can give you some background on what Bitcoin is, how it works, and from that, you might be able to figure out for yourself if it's a good investment. Before I begin, though, I do want to go over some disclaimers. I'm not a licensed financial professional. You should consult one before you make investment decisions. And nothing I say here today should be construed as investment advice to either buy, hold, sell, or transact in any security or cryptocurrency. Do your homework, do your research. You shouldn't invest in things that you don't understand. So take some time to do the research. I hope that this presentation can assist you with that. All investments, including Bitcoin, also carry the risk of loss of principle. So keep that in mind. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the price action here. This has been all over the news. You can see the ridiculous spike in Bitcoin's price relative to the dollar. And this particular chart actually compares it against the S&P 500. This is going back to 2014. The returns are insane. 92% increase for the S&P 500 over the past six and a half years, over 16,000%. And actually, it's gone even higher since I made this um, particular slide. So you can understand why there's such a ridiculous amount of hype behind this. It makes sense why people are talking about it and why people want to get in. They're asking themselves, is it too late? What is this all about? You know, why is there such an increase in the price? So much chatter, etc. So in order to really answer that, and to help set the stage for why Bitcoin might be a good investment vehicle, we have to look at what problems Bitcoin is trying to solve. And let's start with how we transfer money today. Okay, let's take a look at cash. So we see here, really simple exchange cash from one person to another. There's no intermediaries. No banks, no institutions, no fees. Money just gets transferred in exchange for goods and services. And it's very intuitive. We take it for granted that this happens. It's very simple. If we move into other types of money transfers, purchasing something with the credit card or Venmo or transferring money, all of a sudden, now we've got banks and credit card companies and intermediaries, and they all take fees and they all have processing times. It's a major drag on the system. Why? Why is that the case? Well, one of the problems with having a digital currency, by the way, this is true of real estate and stocks too. Um, you have to have intermediaries, escrow, brokerage accounts, etc. But one of the problems is that you have to have something that records proof of ownership when you have a digital currency with cash. When I give you cash, right? I don't have that money anymore. And barring counterfeit, which I'm not going to get into that. No one has to worry about me then spending the same dollar twice or mysteriously having, you know, more money that I didn't have in the past, um, from, an, from, from thin air, so to speak with a digital currency, you have to worry about that. So now banks take on uh, a second function. In the 1800s, if you think about banks, they would physically store money for you. And to some extent they still do, 
but it's all digital and ones and zeros now. Well, why can't we do that for ourselves? The answer is because there's nothing really stopping someone from saying that they just have more money, going into a file and just changing the amount, right? So now banks establish proof of ownership and the validity of a transaction record for money in our society. The problem is in doing so, again, it's slow, it's inefficient, there's fees, um, there's government snooping taking place, and there's inflation. Uh, and then, which we'll get into in a second, additionally, banks represent failure points. They are singular points of attack or failure, and we saw this in 2007, 2008, right? When one sufficiently large institution has problems, it can crash the entire system. And so that's the first set of problems that, that Bitcoin has to address. The second, as I mentioned, is inflation. If you look at this curve, which is provided courtesy of the St. Louis uh, Fed, there's an enormous increase in the supply of money really over decades, but especially during the coronavirus pandemic. We all understand why, because the government's trying to inject money into the system and prop up people and businesses who are suffering. Totally get that. But the history of this chart shows that the value of your savings of your money decreases over time because of continued increases in the money supply. The Federal Reserve targets about a 2% rate of inflation per year, which means if you were to have a bank account with a just a set amount of money in it, you never touched it, the purchasing power of that money is going to decline 2% every year without you having to do anything. That's another problem that Bitcoin is going to seek to address. So let's, let's just sum up this section briefly. Uh, Bitcoin has to solve the following problems. It has to be money or currency, so it has to fulfill that purpose, which means it's a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. And by the way, unit of account um, means that you can actually measure something in terms of it, right? So if you look at a business and you wanted to measure its expected future performance, you would do it in terms of the money that it would generate. Moving on, it also has to address all the problems that we mentioned. It has to be fully digital for efficiency sake, avoiding intermediaries and third parties, still has to be secure, both from a privacy perspective and an accuracy of the transaction record, and then hopefully provide a hedge against inflation that's caused by continued money printing and debt issuance by the government and by the, by the, by the uh, Federal Reserve. So enter the blockchain. The blockchain is the technological and theoretical framework that Bitcoin is, is based off of. And if we follow a transaction through its life cycle here, we're going to fill in some gaps. When you make a Bitcoin transaction, in other words, if I were to send Bitcoin to another party, that transaction gets broadcast to the network of Bitcoin users. And then specific nodes within that network who perform the task of validating these transactions, approve it, assemble all these transactions together into blocks about every 10 minutes or so and chain them together, hence the term blockchain. Each block has a record of all the transactions that happened before it, along with a timestamp and some cryptographic features to make sure that it is accurate and unalterable. So really what we have here is a distributed network. And we'll get into some of these attributes here. It's a public distributed database, essentially, that transactions are broadcast to, and they have to be approved by the majority of the computing power within that network. The network also assemble these, assembles these transactions into blocks and chains them together. And it does so in a way that is essentially unalterable. So you would have to have a majority of the computing power in the network uh, to change the historical record. So there's a common interest in everyone to maintain an accurate record um, such that someone trying to manipulate the system, just say that they have more money than they do or alter historical records is not able to do so just by themselves. It creates a system that is transparent because you can go in 
with a uh, program that actually view the entire historical record of Bitcoin transactions. It's distributed because transactions are maintained uh, by the entire network with each node having its own copy of the entire Bitcoin transaction ledger historically. And it's tamper proof because of what we just mentioned with the, uh, the requirement that at least half of the computing power on that network has to approve transactions for them to be added to the official uh, record of the ledger. So how do new Bitcoins come into existence? So the nodes that are responsible for validating transactions have to expend computing power to do so. And they're actually rewarded for performing these computations uh, because when they happen to be the node that uh, stumbles upon the right cryptographic number to add a Bitcoin block, they are rewarded with the issuance of new Bitcoin. This is done according to an algorithm that increases in difficulty as time goes on. And I'll explain what that means. There will be a maximum of 21 billion Bitcoins in existence ever. It's a hard cap. We've actually, as a society, already mined over 18 million Bitcoin of the 21 million possible. So the vast majority of Bitcoins that can be mined have already been mined. The cool thing about this is that it actually acts as an inflation hedge because the number can't just keep going on forever and ever. You might say to yourself, well, years down the road, if the demand keeps increasing, but there's no more Bitcoins, it's going to drive up the price of Bitcoin continuously. And we'll get into that because that's actually a key component of the investment thesis. But a nice thing about Bitcoin is that it can be subdivided into many different decimal points. Whereas typically with dollars, we're limited to cents, right? Bitcoin can be subdivided much, much further, further than that, much more detailed. So it's not that big of a deal if that ends up happening. But the key point to, to keep in mind here with how Bitcoins are mined is just that the total number in circulation has a defined limit that we are approaching and that it cannot just continue to be inflated forever. In terms of security, you can't just give yourself more Bitcoin or edit your file to say that you have more because the nodes in the network would not accept that as valid. For the same reason, you can't spend a Bitcoin twice. So once you send it and it's approved, that transaction's approved, it's done. This is how Bitcoin solves the double spending problem and proof of ownership by having the transaction record essentially stored and broadcast to this entire network of Bitcoin nodes. Trying to alter the transaction record or to do nefarious things with it would require 51% plus of the computing power in the network. In other words, you would have to compromise or hack or take over over half of the computing power of the entire Bitcoin network, which is to say the least an impossible task. Additionally, from a privacy perspective, Bitcoin, uh, your Bitcoin wallet that stores your Bitcoin has two different keys, a public key, which you can provide to anyone to get them to send Bitcoin to you and a private key that you use to unlock your wallet, so to speak, and transfer Bitcoin to other users. What's cool about this is having a public key enables you to have that public uh, transaction record that anyone can go in and look at and make sure that it's accurate. The private key that you never give to anyone ensures that your Bitcoin stays safe and that you're the only one that can access it. And even though these numbers are linked, it's a one-way link, which means that from your private key, you could actually generate your public key, but the reverse is not possible. So by providing your public key to the greater world or the internet so that people could send you Bitcoins, there is no way for them to reverse engineer your private key and compromise the security of your Bitcoin wallet. This is a key feature of Bitcoin security that we can uh, definitely say contributes to its, to its value because it has to reproduce at least a, a bank level of security for storing your money and sending it, et cetera. 
So let's take a step back. Let's talk about what we said Bitcoin has to do to solve the problems that we identified with the current financial system. So it has to be fully digital and avoid intermediaries while keeping the transaction record accurate, preventing double spending, maintaining proof of ownership, etc. So Bitcoin does that with no branches, no corporate entities or employees as a public distributed ledger that allows direct peer to peer transfer, transfers of money and make sure that nefarious activity can't take place just by its very design. It is secure as well with the public and private key system that makes sure that people are not able to derive your private key to compromise your Bitcoin wallet. Lastly, it solves the problem of central bank inflation by making sure that there is a maximum number of Bitcoins that can ever exist. So it cannot continue to just be inflated forever, sapping your, your money of its value over time, the way it happens to current fiat currency. So it seems pretty good so far, wouldn't you say? Let's get into the investment thesis then. Let's talk about its potential. So like gold before it, Bitcoin represents a hedge against central bank manipulation of the dollar and of other currencies around the world. Gold, however, and gold's been a favorite of people worried about inflation for a long time. Gold has a number of unique problems though, namely the fact that it is physical in nature. You always have to worry about its security, it requires vaults. It's not very liquid, so you, you, it's really hard to just go make a payment with gold. It doesn't really work that way, right? Like hard to send gold to people. There's measurement problems, purity problems. So gold is not a particularly convenient asset in general, regardless of its value. And that really hinders it from becoming a more widely used method of payment. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is able to maintain the inflation hedge that gold tries to be, but does so in a way that is a dramatic departure from the existing financial system. It has much greater speed and efficiency and lower costs than both gold and the dollar and other currencies and has the potential to become a universal, widely accepted payment system that crosses international borders. And so you can see it as either a complement to or even a replacement to currently used government managed or centrally central bank managed currencies. So the bull case for Bitcoin is it becomes this transformative paradigm, sh paradigm shift in economics, reducing transaction costs to near zero, uh, settlement times for sending money like payment terms to near zero and preventing people's savings from depreciating over time and sparing them from the manipulation of central banks. The other thing is, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, if you have something like Bitcoin that has a continued increase in demand, let's say as it becomes more widely adopted, uh, more businesses accept it as payment, more workers are paid in it, it becomes just more widely used. So as demand increases, but supply stays capped, right? Supply stays capped at that 21 million, it's going to cause a rise in price. Uh, there's no way around it. It's a basic supply and demand law of economics where if you have increasing demand and flat supply, it's gonna cause a dramatic increase in price. So far, so good. This is the bull case for Bitcoin. And if you buy this, then this might be why Bitcoin seems like an attractive investment for you. But it is important to keep in mind the risks, which we're gonna get into now. So potential risks, um, Bitcoin isn't backed by anything the same way the dollar isn't. Bitcoin is worth whatever people are willing essentially to pay for it or transact in it. It's not backed by gold or another physical commodity. And because of that, it's essentially vulnerable to speculators driving the price up and down. And we have seen dramatic increases and decreases in the price of Bitcoin over time. Gold at least is linked to industrial uses, uh, to the use as jewelry, because of that, it has some intrinsic value that Bitcoin doesn't really have. So that's the first set of risks that I think um, is very important to keep in mind. You should be prepared for extreme volatility, at least in the near term, while it's still a more speculative asset. 
The what I would say is probably the biggest risk, though, is the fact that because Bitcoin represents such a threat to the established order of things, you can expect governments to take a long and hard look uh, at the regulatory framework and compliance framework around Bitcoin, which we've already seen to some extent. Bitcoin represents a threat to monetary policy and inflation targeting, again, because it's not subject to central bank money printing. It represents a threat to tax and spend policy by the government, because you can imagine a system where Bitcoin becomes almost a parallel economy that's not taxed by the government, like shadow transactions or a whole different off the books ledger. It also, because of its very nature as being secure, lends itself to um, you know attempts to get around anti-money laundering or know your customer laws. So that's been a concern for some, even though I think it's a bit overblown. Uh, it is a threat to the livelihood of bankers. I mean, if you think about the millions of people who work in the banking industry, something that essentially could replace the very function of banks, and that is Bitcoin's potential, potential means that it could you know arouse lobbying efforts to have it banned or have it regulated out of existence because again it represents such a big threat. Lastly, I'll say there is an argument that the computing power necessary to run the Bitcoin network and validate all those transactions has an environmental cost because of the energy involved. I don't know if that's more or less than the energy currently needed to run our banking system, so you would have to net that out, which is beyond the scope of this analysis, but uh, you should know that that is an argument that's been used against Bitcoin. I have a quote here from Janet Yellen, actually, our Treasury Secretary, talking to CNBC. She makes some of these exact points, talking about how Bitcoin, in her mind, is used as an illicit transaction mechanism and that it consumes a lot of energy to do what it does. So, lest you think I'm exaggerating, that's our own Treasury Secretary making some of these exact same arguments against Bitcoin. And actually, even the government of India just introduced, I think earlier today, legislation to even ban the possession of Bitcoin or transacting in it. So you should know that these are real risks that you should um, plan for, be aware of, research before you make the decision to consider Bitcoin as an investment. So in conclusion, when you think about Bitcoin as a potential investment, know what you're investing in know that the potential value of Bitcoin is tied to its potential to totally revolutionize our financial system and the sending of payments back and forth between people and businesses. Additionally, the value is tied up in the fact that as designed, Bitcoin is extremely resilient. It's distributed, it's transparent, it's not subject to central bank manipulation. And even though it does have dramatic price swings right now because it's still such a speculative asset, the long-term case for it would be one of rising prices for Bitcoin or rising value if it continues to be adopted because we know that there's a cap on the number of Bitcoins. On the other hand, there is a case for Bitcoin to experience some negative pressure as time goes on, mainly due to the fact that it is such a threat to our established way of conducting business and banking that I think it will at some point provoke some sort of backlash from the government. What that looks like, I don't know. It could just be increased oversight. It could be more onerous tax rules. I'm not sure, but you have to keep that in mind when evaluating Bitcoin as an investment asset. That being said, hopefully this presentation has helped cover some basics and let you understand what the promise of Bitcoin is, why it's being hyped, why the price is moving the way it is, and what the potential is going forward. Uh, as always, do your homework, do your due diligence before you decide to invest in anything. Feel free to leave questions and comments below. I'll try to get back to you and we can uh, continue this conversation as always, like and subscribe, please. I have more content coming for you. And I look forward to seeing you on future episodes of Real Talk Rudy. Thanks. Bye.